Well, we're going to resume recording. And for those of you that are here, thank you for being here and being here on time. Um, we're with the Kings River today and we, I'm going to have them introduce themselves first for the ones that are here and hopefully the other ones will jump on in a few minutes and we can circle back to them. I have a few slides for those that had information so we'll just work our way through this presentation and then this presentation also goes out to all of the students and teachers so they can go back and watch the full length videos because I know there's multiple videos that we don't have time to watch the entire thing but you'll have access to all of those links and the maps and pictures that are being provided to you today. Uh, so without rambling on anymore, Mary Jane, I'm going to have you kick us off and then we'll just go through introductions and then we'll circle back to you, Mary, and you can do your presentation. Okay, sounds good. I'm Mary Jane Morris. I'm the Education Director with the Kings River Conservancy. Um, I don't know if you want any more at this point or if that's good. That's great. Hi, everyone. I'm Chelsea Jones. I'm a park ranger with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. I work at Pine Flat Lake and Dam. Hello. Annette? Um, did Lynette? I think you're on pause, Lynette. Yeah, Lynette, you need to unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me? There you go. Yep. Okay, I'm Lynette Ballas. My husband and I are beekeepers. Um, I belong to the Kings River Conservancy. I'm on the board and um, we've been beekeeping and keeping bees along the river um, on and off for the last, um, well, we've been beekeepers for 40 years, but along the Kings River for the last five years. Awesome. Well, thank you, ladies. Um, so I will start off with Mary Jane, and this is what I have. And then I do have that moonlight video if you wanted me to show any of those portions, but I will let you take off from there. And then Chelsea, you will be next. I just noticed that I was muted. <laughs> the reason that I'm here today um, to share our information with you is because if you're looking to work in agriculture at all, um, you need to consider where the water is coming from that you're gonna be irrigating your crops with. And in this area, it's from the Kings River. Well, we have a problem at the Kings River right now with a lot of people throwing their trash into the water. So um, for a conservation side of things, it's just not a cool thing to do to bring your trash up to the river and dump it. We take out literally hundreds of pounds of trash um, monthly. Lately, because of COVID, there's been more people going up to the river and utilizing the, um, the, the park benches and everything that we have there. And they're just leaving tons of trash. But when it goes into the water itself, that's a huge issue because that affects not only the ecosystem, but it affects the water that you're gonna be irrigating your plants with. So um, what we do with the Kings River Conservancy is a number of things. Me being the education director, I go to the school systems and talk to the students. Um, I do some presentations on what we do, uh, not only introducing the ecology of the river, but also um, safe recreational practices and you know conservation efforts in general. So we do a number of different things to engage students and the community in itself as to what goes on at the Kings River. Um, the Conservancy kind of manages the water entryways all the way from Pine Flat Dam down to Route 99. So it's a 30 mile stretch that we kind of monitor and, and clean up and all of that. But we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, which means that we don't get paid to do this. It's, it's a nonprofit organization. So we get grant money to help us bring in people to help us clean the area. Or if we put um, interpretive trail signs, which we've done recently, um, we get grants for that. So um, 
it's it's not like we you know get tons tons of money to do our work um, we have a lot of things that we do to try and raise money and one of the things that we have coming up right now is a photo contest and what we're doing is uh, we normally have our big um, fundraiser this time of year, but because of COVID, we can't do face-to-face -face meetings. So we're doing a photo contest where anyone can participate, but there are rules and regulations. And part of those rules are that the pictures need to be taken on the Kings River, somewhere on the King, Kings River. And it could be a picture of anything. It could be a plant, an animal, a person, it could be trash, it could be anything. And we're giving um, cash prizes to the photos that we, will, we're gonna have um, photographers are actually going to pick the best pictures out of this and then they will um, give prizes. Any students who wanna participate in this can participate for free. Um, anyone over the age of 18 that wants to participate, that's not a student, um, will pay $5 per uh, photo that they enter into the, the contest. So um, that will help us with our efforts for cleaning up along the river and, and any large scale projects that we have. Um, also, we're always looking for volunteers. We're always looking for people who wanna do a, a job trail. You know, if somebody wants to um, shadow us for a day and see what we do, um, learn about conservation efforts. We work in close proximity with the Kings River Conservation District, the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, we work with um, the Kings River Water Association, uh, Fresno County, the local sheriff's office, wildlife, um, so the, the game warden. So there's all kinds of people that students can job shadow if they're interested. And if they're looking for um, an aspect of moving into a different career line or something like that, they can always contact us at kingsriverconservancy.org and we'd be happy to um, help them with uh, their plight. <laughs> You had me include one of this picture right here. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's all like fishing line, if I am yes. mistaken. Can you tell us a little bit about that and, oh, and how that yeah. works? Yeah, I can tell you a lot about that. Uh, what's interesting is that if you've gone up to the Kings River, I'm sure you've seen a ton of people who fish along the river. Well, the biggest, I would say, um, conservation issue that we deal with along the shores of the Kings River is fishing line. So we put in a number of fishing line recycle bins right up along the river. So if you do fish, you can actually put your excess fishing line in there instead of throwing it on the ground and it landing in the water because that in itself is such a health hazard, not only to the plants, but the animals that are um, along the Kings River. That was, that picture was taken from the first time that we had just put those recycle bins in. And it was the first time that I emptied the re recycle bin trash, the trash containers that um, they were there for a week. And we had already gotten, that was from one recycle bin, it was loaded. So people were using it, which was really cool. We were happy to see that people knew what it was and that they were willing to use it instead of throwing the trash on the ground. So it did what it was supposed to do. And that was an awesome thing to see. So we go up regularly and clean them out. And if students are interested in helping us with this project, um, this fishing line is recyclable. It does not break down. It would take about 500 years for that fishing line to break down in the environment. So it's really important that it doesn't stay in, in the area or in the water. So by us taking it up and recycling it separately from, you know, you could see in the other picture, all the other trash, we take cans and recycle the cans and, you know, anything that we can put in the dumpster we do, but recyclable stuff, I haul away. Um, so the fishing line itself gets sent to a special processing plant 
and they take care of recycling this fishing line for us. They also keep track nationally of where the fishing line comes in from, how much fishing line it is and all of that. So it's pretty cool. So if any students wanna get involved in that project, they can call us and it would be really fun you know, for them to keep track and say how much they're taking off of the river um, on a regular basis. Awesome, thank you. Sure. Um, we will circle back to your video if there's time at the end, because um, I think there's some important information in there that'll give them some more details. And I think we'll have time, but just to double check, um, we'll move on to Chelsea and then we'll come back to you unless anyone has questions for Mary before we move on. Okay, so this is Chelsea and I'll let her talk about her photo and then I have your videos queued up when you're ready. Great, again, hello everyone. I am a park ranger for the US Army Corps of Engineers. We are, we partner a lot with the Kings River Conservancy and Mary and her education program. I'm working from home today, so I put a little picture up there for you to see. I'm not in uniform or have a beautiful background today, which is very rare. Um, I worked for the Army Corps for about three years. I'm originally from Pennsylvania, so I've only been in California the three years I've worked for the Army Corps. Um, I also was a park ranger with the National Park Service before I transferred agencies. So the Army Corps has a whole bunch of different missions. Those short videos that we're gonna play will give you a brief introduction to a few of them. Can you guys see that okay? Yes. The Sacramento District is one of the largest districts in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, with boundaries that include all or part of eight western states, covering 290,000 square miles. Headquartered in Sacramento, we have field offices in Colorado, Utah, Nevada, and Northern California to manage construction projects and carry out our regulatory role to help protect and preserve America's water resources. We manage construction projects on military installations in Utah, Nevada, and throughout Northern and Central California. And we own and operate 17 dams and reservoirs lining the foothills of California's Sierra Nevada, the front line of one of the world's largest systems of flood risk management infrastructure. Sacramento is one of the most at-risk cities in the country for major flooding. California's Central Valley is essentially one big bowl with a natural tendency to fill up with water from winter rains and melting snow. Over time, we've helped build or improve many of the dams, levees, and bypasses we rely on today to reduce the risk of flooding for nearly 2.5 million inhabitants of the state capital's metropolitan area. In 1955, we built Sacramento's major buffer against flooding, Folsom Dam. Did you have anything to add to that before I skip over to your next portion? No, you can go right on to the next one. Did you know the Corps of Engineers is one of the nation's leading providers of outdoor recreation? Here at the Sacramento District, we have 10 parks, which offer top-notch facilities and amazing views. We're fortunate to have a little history at our parks too. The Knights Ferry Bridge at Stanislaus River Parks is the longest covered bridge west of the Mississippi and was designated a National Historic Landmark in 2012. From mega projects that reduce flood risk to lakeside campsites for the whole family, restoring and protecting the environment to supporting our military members past and present, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Sacramento District remains dedicated to building strong Hmm. Okay, and then you have this video as well. Then there's just another short snippet here. It'll go a little bit more into uh, what I do day to day. Go ahead with that. We build and restore critical wildlife habitats for endangered species, work to control invasive species, and replenish eroded shorelines and marshlands. We regulate activities that impact our nation's waterways and wetlands to protect important resources and aquatic habitats. We clean up hazardous waste, both on and off military installations. Can you give us somewhere to enjoy nature? As one of the nation's leading federal providers of outdoor recreation, 
we host about 370 million visitors to our 400 lake and river projects annually. We serve as stewards for 12 million acres of public lands and waters used for recreation, water supply, and water quality. Great, thanks for sharing those. Yeah, thank you. That's a very brief introduction to a few of the missions of the Army Corps of Engineers. I definitely recommend we have a YouTube channel, the Sacramento District of US Army Corps of Engineers. There's a bunch of cool videos on there on a variety of topics. There's also a pretty neat um, 360 tour of a small area of Pine Flat Lake and the dam. And we are closed right now to dam tours and educational tours, which we would typically provide. So it's a nice way to kind of get online and um, see the area that I'm talking about, especially if you've never been there. But um, let's talk about location here. So if you look at this map, if you find Fresno, um, just to the right of that is Pine Flat Lake. And you can see the blue shows our watershed there. If you follow it down towards Hanford, you'll see it drains into that real light colored area called the Tulare Lake Bed. So that is the watershed that I'm talking about. Pine Flat Lake is up where I actually work. And like I said, the main missions of the US Army Corps of Engineers is flood control and irrigation. So the Flood Control Act of 1944 is what authorized the construction of Pine Flat Dam and, a, and many other dams across the country. If you're looking at that map there, you see a few other lakes. Below Pine Flat, you can see Coea. Below that, Lake Isabella. Those are also Army Corps of Engineers run locations and we have dams that we manage there as well. Can you go ahead and flip to the next slide for me, please? All right, so here's some information about the dam. Um, as you can see, it um, covers a pretty cool area. It was built from 1947 to 1954. And like I said, that was built by the US Army Corps of Engineers. The water is used for irrigation. So our rich agricultural area of the San Joaquin Valley, the Central Valley, where we grow all these awesome crops, uh, is being fed from water from the Kings River that flows out of Pine Flat Dam. It was built in the Kings River Canyon Corridor which is the narrowest part of the canyon. If you flip to the next slide, you'll see a pretty good view of that river canyon. There it is. So as you can see where the dam spans across is a pretty narrow section there. Um, our ability to store water and use it wisely has allowed for the San Joaquin Valley to remain one of the richest agricultural areas in the world. So it's pretty important we play a pretty big role. Um, my role in this would be after we built the dam, now we have all the water that built up behind it, Pine Flat Lake or Reservoir. And once we have a lake that's formed, we have people who wanna go boating, swimming, camping, come out and go hiking. Uh, we have wildlife that calls the area home and always has. We have a whole bunch of natural resources that need protection. So the Army Corps of Engineers formed our Recreation and Natural Resource Division, which is my position as a park ranger. I helped to make sure visitors who come out to Pine Flat Lake to recreate do so safely, and also protect those resources that we are um, managing. So that's kind of a very basic idea of what I do as a park ranger. We also always have multiple volunteer opportunities, anything from coming out and helping uh, control the litter efforts uh, to helping us build some trails, or um, we do a whole bunch of education programs, water safety, things like that. Another thing to keep in mind is we do have student positions. We have student rangers and we have student maintenance. So those are the two sides of the, uh, the house that we have at Pine Flat Lake, the maintenance and the rangers. Um, and between the two sides of the house, we control everything at the lake and dam there. Um, so if you have any more questions, please feel free to reach out and let me know. We have a whole bunch more resources I can share with you. Does anyone have any questions for Chelsea? I'm just curious how you got into this field. <laughs> Great question. It's a complex story, but the short version is I went to school for teaching. As I was teaching, I got a summer job working for the National Park Service. I learned I love being outside in the summers way more than I love being inside teaching all year. So I turned my summer career into a full-time permanent career with the National Park Service and became a park ranger. 
I did go back to school for that. I, it wasn't required. All that's required is being 18 and older, a U.S. citizen, uh, and a you, it helps if you have a biology or science or ag or forestry background, but it's not mandatory. Um, so I took my background and I applied that to being a park ranger. Park service brought me out to California and I decided to stay. So I transferred agencies to work with the Army Corps of Engineers. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. Any other questions? If you think of any uh, later on, we can, we'll all circle back to everyone so you guys can ask as well. Um, let's see, my slide's not quite changed. Did you have anything to say about this? That's just a pretty neat picture there. You can see the dam um, and the river flowing out of it. Behind it, you can see how expansive that lake is. So there along our lake shore, we have all those recreation areas that we manage. We have marinas, campgrounds, picnic areas, boat launches, hiking trails, things like that. It's just a pretty neat picture of the whole area there. Those are our recreation areas. So that's a map of the recreation contained within Pine Flat Lake. The bottom left corner would be the dam in that checkered area and the river flowing out of it. So that's the lower Kings River. Then you move towards the right, which is the body of the lake of Pine Flat Lake. And as you move towards the far right, that's where the upper Kings River flows into Pine Flat Lake. Awesome. Did Richard end up, thanks Chelsea. Did Richard end up joining us, Mary? You're muted. Sorry, I don't see him on right now. Okay. Um, and Heidi, I didn't see Heidi either. I didn't see Heidi either. And Matthew sent me some slides, um, but I don't. I didn't see him log on either. Is that mm -hmm. correct? I haven't seen him either. Okay, so then I believe Lynette. I don't have any slides for Lynette, but I will let her talk and introduce herself and what she does, which I think sounds really cool. And yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't know I was supposed to send slides, so. You, it wasn't required, it was more oh. just if you had anything you wanted me to show. Okay, well. I do, um, have, I do have something to add to that. If you go onto our website, the kingsriverconservancy.org, onto the education page, there's an interview that I did with Lynette and her husband about beekeeping and how beekeeping is important for agriculture. Okay. So if you just go onto that site, you can um, view that video. I can add that in before I send this out to all the students. Okay, there's a few of them on there. There's actually three videos that we have on there of the beekeeping. And then there's a link to one that we just did recently about um, uh, pollinating almond, the almond fields. Okay, perfect. So my husband and I have been beekeeping since the late 70s, and we have currently between, uh, we have about 45 hives. We normally run about 100 beehives because, of course, they're very important for agriculture. We, um, we have various locations where we leave our uh, our bees to um, pollinate different things. Currently, we're still in the almonds, but they are finished blooming. If you've noticed all the white trees, those are almond trees, and they require two beehives per acre to be pollinated. There are some self-pollinating varieties now, but they still require one hive. We're also in the cherries right now. They have to go to blueberries, they have to go to apples. There's a whole lot of different crops, in fact, one third of our uh, food would go away if we did not have honeybees and other native pollinators. Now, there's a lot of um, a lot of uh, agriculture along the Kings River, and so bees are necessary in those places. But um, my husband and I are more more than happy to share some of our knowledge with some of the students if they were interested in getting into beekeeping. We need more young beekeepers, that is for sure. It's a, it's a growing industry. In fact, uh, across the nation, bees come into California for the almond pollination, which is normally a six week pollination. This week, because it's been so warm and so dry, it was only three weeks long. And um, so we're struggling getting our bees to uh, have food because very soon the oranges are gonna start blooming and we'll take them into those, but you probably have seen this next week, 
it's supposed to be 88 degrees for three or four days. And so all those beautiful wildflowers that are along the Kings River and other places that the bees would connect, collect nectar and pollen from would probably be dying. So um, it's, a hard, it's a hard life for beekeeping to, um, you know, to balance uh, where they need to be and to keep them healthy. So um, I, I don't know what else to tell you about that, except that it's, it is very fun to make honey. <laughs> How did you and your husband get into beekeeping? Like, when did this start? Well, I um, I actually wasn't married to him at the very the beginning. He and his father had an organic farm back in the late seventies before the word organic was um, a word, <laughs> and they had to um, they needed to pollinate some crops. So they bought a beehive from a neighbor who was a beekeeper, and then the next year they had to split it in half because it got too big. If you don't take care of your bees, then they will swarm, which this is the season for swarming as well. So. So uh, he had two hives and then he decided this is what he wanted to do. So we got married soon after that, bought 30 hives and it's been a, a up and down journey since then. And then sorry for all the questions for you, but bees kind of scare me sometimes. So uh, oh, sure. just like curious, like how often do you get stung? Like, how do you deal with that? It like, I'm sure others are wondering the same. So so we do get stung. It's part of being a beekeeper. Uh, we both wear suits. We wear a veil and a, and a shirt jack, and we wear gloves when we work bees. And we hope that we don't get stung, but um, usually the, the site is just very itchy for a bit of time, and then it goes away. So um, be, there are various uh, types of bees. We use Italian bees, which are bees actually from Italy. So I don't know if the students know this, but the the your the na the bee that everyone sees is actually a European honey bee, and it came over when the settlers came over in the 1700s. This is not a native bee to the United States, and it is one of only two bees that actually make excess honey for us to take. Most other all the other different 20,000 different species of bees have, uh, they make only enough to feed themselves. So that's why we're able to uh, harvest honey from the bees. That's awesome. Thank you. Anyone have any questions for Lynette? I'm trying to minimize my screen back to normal. None. Okay, then I think this is a great time to circle back to Mary's um, Moonlight Over the River video. And I think the others will be joining us here shortly. Let me just get this queued up and move all the ads out of the way. Um, so the first portion of this whole thing, it, it sounds like it's, a, it's mostly a fundraising like type video and there's a lot of other information in it. I just tried to pick out the most important information that I thought would be helpful to share with students um, today. So we're gonna start it at, it's gonna take a minute just cause it's YouTube and it's loading. It talks about the river access mm -hmm. points and hopefully it will go here. John Gray. I'm a board member of the Kings River Conservancy. I've been asked to talk about access to the Kings River. What does that mean, access to the river? Uh, different people, it means different stuff. Uh, the Conservancy Board looks at a different, what we call user groups. When we look at access, we're trying to make the river as open to as many different user groups as we can. Whether it's a family out on a picnic, whether it's a fly fisherman looking for the trophy trout, 
whether it's a college kid looking to float in an inner tube from Goodfellow Bridge down to Reedley, or whether it's a, a water skier down in the Kingsburg area. Getting on the river is how people in my neighborhood recreate. <laughs> Today, in our society, a lot of people are stressed and they're overweight and having an opportunity to get out into a natural environment like this uh, gives you an opportunity to exercise and enjoy nature and uh, there's a lot of different ways to do that but being able to get out on the river and kayak adds a little bit of an element of excitement with that and so for people that are stressed or struggling with weight or uh, just need an opportunity to get out with family and friends having access to a river like this is phenomenal. River Conservancy was started about 15 years ago and when we first started the Conservancy we noticed that compared to other rivers that there's a lot of public access points already available. If you look at a map there's it depends on how you count them 8 to 12, 12 to 15 public access points. By that I mean the county has land, the city, city of Sanger, city of Reedney, city of Kingsburg, all these municipalities have access points to the Kings River, and that's unlike any other river in our area. So what the Conservancy does, we have been enhancing making those public accesses better. Uh, we do that through signs, we do that through trails, adding restrooms, uh, parking lots, ADA accessible stuff. It's kind of a cool thing what we've been doing. A lot of people ask me, hey, John, what are the future plans for Kings River Conservancy? And that is a great question. Uh, but stay tuned. Uh, we need your support, not only financially, but volunteers. All that stuff is being evaluated right now. So uh, let's put our best foot forward and show our uh, neighbors that we Mary, if you had anything to add, feel free. And uh, in the meantime, I'll move forward to the projects portion. The only thing that I would like to add is um, that, I, and John mentioned it too in the video, is that we do have a number of trails out there where you can go for a hike. Um, we have one trail that's called the North Riverside Trail. That's about a mile and a half. And we have some interpretive trail signs on there to tell you different things about the river, um, some critters that you might see there. There's some informational signs about Pine Flat Dam, about the Army Corps, and about the Conservancy itself. So if you ever want to just take a walk, and we do have some picnic tables and some park benches there, so you can rest along the way and relax. Um, it's really a nice place to go out for a picnic for the day. Um, we also have partnered with the Army Corps and helped to develop the other side of the river that used to be a campground. And um, we've, we've made a little education pavilion there that we can take classes out. You can do an outdoor class, um, do some water experiments. 
and the Army Corps is working right now, and I'll let Chelsea talk a little bit more about this. Um, they're putting in some pollinator gardens and food plots in the area, um, which is really kind of cool and definitely looking for students to help with that project if they're interested. Um, we also just finished working on an area, well, we didn't finish, um, but we just finished putting signs in there on the county side behind where the um, Army Corps area is, the wildlife management area, we put in an area that's called the Raptor Walk. And it's a trail that's pretty hard access. It's not easy access like our other trails, um, but it's an area where you'll see all kinds of raptors there. You'll see bald eagles, um, shoulder hawk, red shoulder hawks, uh, uh, you'll see peregrine falcon, you'll see um, uh, heron, egret. So there's a number of birds that you can see out that way. It's really a nice, nice place to take a stroll. So if, if you had any questions about some of those areas that we manage, um, again, just contact us and we'd be happy to take you on a tour out there. Thank you. As the demand for recreational use along the Kings River increased, so did the need for resource management. To meet this need, Kings River Conservancy has identified and delivered capital improvement projects that enhance the access and use of public properties along the Lower Kings River. Just within the last decade, Kings River Conservancy has built trails, public use buildings, and park facilities, all for the community to enjoy. The Conservancy's work has helped to uh, enhance the availability to the community by uh, developing, especially the Northside Trail, which took a lot of work here. It's uh, accessible uh, even for um, it's ADA compliant, these two, because it's flat. And uh, so most everyone can uh, have a short walk along here. There's uh, signs that the Conservancy uh, put in place to uh, help educate them about ecology um, and you know the animals and plants that they, they will see along the trail uh, and uh, provide access other than simply the parking lot for them to uh, even with uh, modest effort um, appreciate that. We also um, uh, have a bathroom that was installed and park benches and picnic tables uh, to again help um, Help, help in their uh, just enjoyment of the riverside. Uh, we also maintain a, um, uh, a small park uh, called Thorburn Park, uh, where the river intersects uh, Highway 180. It's open on the weekends. And again, people can uh, come and have a picnic lunch, uh, can, uh, you know, put their hot feet in the water and just enjoy the, uh, enjoy the river uh, with, again, access that is easily um, there uh, by, by automobile. Uh, one of the major conversations and agreements for uh, a project is to develop this outside into a trail, similar to what we have here on the north side. And uh, so that is uh, one of the things we're going to call it the raptor walk. Uh, raptors are birds such as hawks and, and ospreys, meat-eating or fish-eating birds, because we have several that live and hunt along the river. All of the maintained trails, bathrooms, parking lots, park benches, grills, educational signs, and more could not have been possible without supporters like you. The Kings River Conservancy volunteers really want to continue this work, but need your help. Okay, and then I have a fish releasing snippet and an education program, if you want me to go ahead with those, Mary. Sure. 
The fish release is really fun. Um, it's something that we, we uh, team up with the Kings River Conservation District for, and they do that a few times a year. Right now, because of COVID, it's been hard to get volunteers to participate, but once um, things get back to normal a little bit, we always encourage volunteers to come out and help with it because it's a lot of fun. Is that something if we were doing this in person that they would be able to participate in? Yes, what absolutely. Okay, here it is. I feel that donations coming into the Kings River Conservancy are really important for a number of reasons. One of those reasons being that the Conservancy advocates for the recreational areas that so many people use in the Central Valley. Uh, the river is a natural resource for a number of reasons and having a group that's dedicated to family recreation um, protecting the ecology of the river and then also keeping the river clean is critical to this area. They serve a huge purpose for us all and it benefits people whether they're, they really realize it or not. Another great thing about the Conservancy is, is their environmental education. I'm a huge advocate of the work that they're doing out here. They bring groups of school children out on a regular basis and they get to come out on the trail, learn about the environment. They get to touch, see and feel things. All right, here's the bill, you guys. If you want to release them, you got to carry them. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, so you can follow in Heidi. Yes, follow me in. I will take you guys and I will be with right. you in a little while. Oftentimes, I'm lucky enough to host groups of kids that come out with the Conservancy field trips and let them release the trout from our incubator building. you we get kids of all ages and while not every single kid wants to be a biologist when he grows up um, even the really young kids to the kids who are in high school all seem to just really enjoy it I mean it's a really cool thing when you see these little baby fish that she had in the bucket swimming out into the river to explore like this whole big new world that they're they're moving off into and then you have to kind of wonder you know are they going to make it? Are they going to be successful? You know, well, what's life going to be like for the next few weeks as these fish swim off into the river? And will I catch one someday? Might I actually catch one of the fish that I put into the river when I come back out? Yeah. Okay, let me help you come back across. Normally, these three runs a year, sometimes two, and it totals about three to four hundred thousand baby fish that we put in the river each year. Absolutely. I took some pictures of that. Now, when people leave their trash behind on the river, it affects, um, I would say it mostly affects the birds here in the ecosystem. But as for the fish, when you have micro particles of stuff, they'll often see something floating and mistake it for food. And uh, fish can oftentimes pick up little pieces of plastic, little pieces of paper, and things that aren't healthy for it either. And uh, if you're a fisherman who likes to fish out here and eat the fish that you catch, um, eating a fish that has swallowed something that it shouldn't or that's in water that's been polluted by human dumping, um, I, it's not ideal. It's definitely a year-round fishery that's accessible to people from all over the valley. A lot of the fisheries up north have been closed to fishing or at least seasonally because they're looking out for the salmon populations up there. Um, the kern down below us tends to get warmer faster than we do and so uh, we're really a great centralized location for people to come in and fish any time of the year that they want to. I mean, don't be, don't be good anymore. Fantastic. Anything else you'd like to add on that, Mary? I think that'd be really cool to do in person. If someone wanted to sign up for that, like how, if a student wanted to do that, not affiliated with our group, like would they be able to now? Do they have to wait for COVID to end? 
Uh, well, right now, what they did was they, they did a limited group this year. Um, so everyone had to be screened and everyone had to, you've got to fill out applications. They were only allowing people who were 18 and over because of COVID um, to help out with this year's release. But normally we'll, we'll take, you know, all ages to come out um, and at least participate in some way, if not um, help with the release. So that we're waiting for the school systems to see what's gonna happen next fall. And um, if things are a little bit more open then the conservation district may allow for some some more additional help with students so they can contact us and we can get them in touch with the conservation district or they can contact the kings river Cons conservation district themselves and um, see how they can get involved with that okay thank you and then this is the last segment that i have for today <laughs> Mary Jane Morris, the Education Director with the Kings River Conservancy. The education program with the Kings River Conservancy started a few years ago, and it primarily began as an effort to educate the local community about the Kings River itself, the ecology of the Kings River, and especially the environmental changes that happened once the Pine Flat Dam was put in, and the safe recreational practices along the Kings River. So one couple of the ways that we've actually been trying to get the community involved is by starting with local school systems. We thought by bringing the kids from the local schools into the area and bringing them on tours where we bring them, we do um, an educational tour of the Pine Flat Dam. We do a tour of our incubation house or the incubation house that we have with the Kings River Conservation District. Um, we take them on tours here to learn about the flora and fauna of the area and get the kids involved in projects. Welcome to the North Riverside Trail along the Kings River. We're gonna take a little river walk today. And along the river, we actually have some interpretive trail signs that are in three languages. So you can read a little bit about the history of the river and about what you'll find on the river along your right. Honeybees are really cool for the environment. They're pollinators. So they carry the pollen from the plants on their legs and they bring it from plant to plant. So they actually pollinate more than 30% of the foods that we eat. So very important for our environment to have honeybees. So along the Kings River, we find lots of critters. And this time of year when it's warmer and the sun is out, we'll find a lot of reptiles, especially snakes. So one of the things you have to look out for is actually the North Pacific, Pacific rattlesnake um, because they are dangerous. Uh, one of my favorite things that I see along the river is mullen. And this one is dried out. It's getting ready to, to bloom again. You can see the green on the bottom. And this gets big, fluffy kind of leaves. You'll see the leaves will come out in all different sides around the base. And then it'll grow a big yellow stalk or a stalk of yellow flowers um, that grow pretty tall. This has a bunch of seeds on it here. Excellent for the environment. And even more so, it's edible and it's excellent for respiratory conditions. Well, we wake. Anything you'd like to add to that, Mary? Um, what we do is we gear all of our field trips towards what the class is looking for. So there's different educational programs that we do. We do scavenger hunts. We do all kinds of fun things for all different age groups. Um, and 
it's just really nice to get out to the river, even if you don't necessarily want to go there to learn something. It's fun to be there just to enjoy the experience of, of uh, nature right in your own backyard. So um, the Kings River is close. It's not where you have to drive hours to get somewhere. And uh, you can see some pretty cool things. Awesome. Thank you. And then I saw Richard has joined us. So Richard, if you would like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do with Kings River, we are ready for you. You are muted. Richard, you're muted. Um, you're still muted. There okay. You, there we go. Okay. So are you ready for me to talk about what I want to talk about? Yep, we're ready. Okay, sorry. Okay, so, uh, and the kids are listening or what? Yeah, there is some students and teachers on here from Fresno, um, Madeira, some of their names, their usernames, I can't, I don't recognize right now, but yes, there are some on here. It's also being recorded. So that way those who missed it today, cause they're on spring break, um, they will get a copy of the video and their teachers also will get a copy. Okay, and I don't know if the kids got copies of what I sent you guys uh, for my little notes, but I'm going to be uh, using, uh, just talking from me. So it's about planting trees. And uh, the one thing I was gonna point out at the beginning uh, was that you need to decide what is it, what's your purpose for planting the trees that you're thinking of planting? And are they gonna be deciduous? or evergreen is a big uh, thing to consider. And uh, one thing, a deciduous means that it's going to lose its leaves uh, in the fall of the year. And so uh, sometimes that's a good thing and sometimes it's a concern. And so you need to be aware if you're planting a new tree, what, uh, and then we'll get into some of those, what is the reason for planting a tree? So if you want total shade uh, all the time, uh, winter and summer, then you might want to consider planting an evergreen. My, the south edge of my property where I live has a whole bunch of redwood trees and they really provide a lot of shade from the southern exposure to the sun. And then I have ash trees that are uh, on two sides of my uh, area, especially on the west side. So in the summer, it really, I, I can sit on the patio and I have really good shade. Uh, but in the winter, when you want that sun to come into your house because it's cold out there, then you uh, would probably want to have a deciduous tree there. So you need to check with, uh, you know, your plan of whatever you're going to plant. Is it around your house? Is it an open area? Maybe you have five acres. Uh, uh, those are some of the reasons and things that you want to consider. And like on number four on my notes, I kind of had those a little bit out of order, was... Um, you know, do you want, are you providing shade? Is it for privacy? Uh, sometimes uh, on bigger farm areas, or if you're in a windy area, you might want a wind protection. When I lived in Southern California, when I was teaching down there, uh, there were a lot of places had eucalyptus trees alongside one of the edges of the property. So that broke up that solid mass of wind that came zooming through there at various times of year. So it kind of broke that up a little bit. And so that's one thing. Uh, Planting a tree, are you gonna, is, is the tree for fruit or oranges, things like that? Is it something in the backyard? Uh, most of us that live in town, I have, my backyard is broken up into two areas. I have a pond and a small grass area up front, which would be like a normal backyard. But then I transition from, through a, um, a gazebo into the back backyard. And I have a little greenhouse back there, a garden area. And then I have some orange trees and fruit trees back there. So uh, is that what you're trying to do? So you wanna do that uh, as a consideration. Uh, one of the other things uh, is what climate, you wanna pick a tree according to that's gonna survive in the climate that you're in. California, as you know, is like 800 miles from uh, Northern California, Southern California. And there's a big difference. Uh, just up in Madera, if you're driving from Fresno, Madera, uh, about halfway there, there's two trees there. One's a palm tree right in the middle of 99. 
representing Southern California. And then there's a, a fir tree representing Northern California. And you pass them, they're right next to each other. They're right in the middle of the two lanes of uh, roads there. So uh, what is your climate? Will the tree you plant there survive in that area? You might like it, it's pretty, it's got flowers, but maybe it can't handle the, the winter in the particular area where you're at. And so that's something else. The other thing you wanna consider is what is, uh, what's the tree gonna look like when it's mature? We all say, oh, well, look at this big open area when we plant something new around our new house or new property or where you're at. And then uh, 15 or 20 years later, uh, these trees have grown together and uh, they provide, they don't let any sun in because you got branches every single uh, place and they're touching each other. So that's something, you, how high is it gonna be, get? Uh, I had to have somebody prune one of my branches that was going over towards my neighbors. And he had a guy there and I got a hold of him and he came over and pruned one branch, but just one big branch and maybe it was 10 inches in diameter going towards my neighbors. It cost me $500 just to cut that one branch down because a guy had to climb up there with all kinds of ropes and pulleys and saws and, and all that kind of stuff to get at that one branch to prune it back. Uh, the other thing you wanna consider, number six I had was uh, consider the root problem. Is, are the, is the tree you're gonna put in there uh, going to cause roots uh, a problem into your uh, driveway or other areas that you're trying to work with. Uh, I have some of these redwood trees in my backyard and they were all great. My lawn was all nice and good uh, for the first five or six years. But then after that, the roots of the redwoods were right there on top because they want to get all the water they can. And so the grass would hardly grow because it was shady. The, the roots of the tree were sucking up all the water and the grass would not grow. So that was something else to consider. Also sewer pipes become a problem. If you're planting trees and there happens to be a sewer line, not so bad in the, the city, but if you live in the country, uh, you have a big open area there, you're gonna have a problem. Uh, don't plant too close to the fence because it's like I said, I had to prune this one branch so my neighbor didn't get mad. And if, if it's a branching tree that spreads out and has a, a 20 foot diameter, 20, 10 feet is on your property and 10 feet of it's on your neighbor's property, he may not like that and wanna get rid of it. Um, again, uh, if you're planting fruit trees, uh, some trees need a pollinator and uh, like an almonds, uh, you need two different kinds of varieties or uh, uh, berry, uh, Cherries used to have, I have one that has both the pollinators on the same tree, but sometimes you need two trees for one to pollinate the other. And if you don't have it, you're not gonna get any fruit or nuts off of it. So that's something to consider. When you plant the tree, you wanna make sure that you dig the hole big enough. Uh, if it's a smaller plant, well, dig it, or any size plant, whatever you're putting in there, you wanna, the root ball may be only a foot wide, but you maybe wanna, dig a hole that's two foot wide and two foot deep so that tree can go in there well and the loose soil goes in and the roots have a chance to get into that soil. And my property, when I dug a pond and plant, tried to plant trees here, there's a lot of uh, uh, hard rock in there from uh, uh, that it's hard to, for the roots to get through there, hard pan it's called. So make sure that you know the size of uh, what you're using. Now, I don't know if you can see this, doesn't look like you can see it on there. No. Anyhow, you should know what's the difference between a square nose shovel and a pointed shovel. If you're gonna dig a hole, you want a, a round nose shovel so it can dig the hole and get the dirt out of there and you're able to use it as a spade to dig the hole. Then when you get the hole and you're ready to fill the dirt back in or you're gonna add compost in it and put that kind of stuff back in the hole, a square nose shovel will handle more dirt you can scrap, scrape things level. So you might wanna have both types of shovels available when you're doing your project. And then uh, the another one would be to uh, stake your tree properly. So when you uh, wanna stake it, if it's a, a big, big tree, you might have to put stakes out of ways and tie them three different directions with a rope. If it's just a small tree, you don't want the wind to knock off the branch and uh, bend it and break it in half. So you might wanna have two stakes, one on each side, maybe one from the direction where the uh, tree is, uh, where the wind is blowing from, and tie, tie a, 
a rubber thing there, like an inner tube or a rope or something to tug it one way and then have the other post where you tie it to the other direction. So it'll stay fairly stable until it gets big enough to survive on its own. Once it gets three, two or three inches, and maybe it's big enough and you can take those stakes out and it doesn't look kind of like an eyesore. Um, do I have a little more time or no? Um, yeah, you're gonna wanna start wrapping up here shortly. Okay, so uh, uh, you wanna plant whenever the it's mild weather, like right now it's starting to warm up. So anytime in the winter or when uh, trees are dormant, it's a good time. You used to sell a lot of bare root trees, but they don't have so many of those anymore. But uh, right now you're getting kind of late to plant. Make sure you're watering them uh, properly uh, from time to time so that they're staying uh, healthy. And uh, you may want to, if you're pruning a tree, like where I work at Scout Island, we had a people come and get a bunch of trees, but if they're cutting a big root to get it out of the ground or out of the pot, then you better cut back the main branches of the tree also. And I think that's it. Awesome. Thank you, Richard, for sharing that information with us. Does anyone have any questions for Richard uh, before we move on to Matt? I saw Matt's on. Okay. Matt, you are up if you can hear us. Um, really? All right. There you are. Yep, Just let me I'm know here. if you want me to go to the next. Yeah. Uh, so my name is Matt Meadows. I'm from Kings River Water Association. And I thought I might give you a, a quick little primer on how the Kings River water kind of works and where it comes from and all of that. Um, every river is different. So I'll just give you a quick little one on Kings River. You can go to the next slide. The big question is where does our water come from? Most of us live in the valley or the foothills and it rains, but most of our water comes from the mountains, the snowpack. Um, California is one of those places, many places in the world where people live and use water that comes from somewhere else. So most of our water supply is coming from the snow, uh, the snowpack up in the mountains, um, which kind of brings us to an interesting time for this class because right now we're out snow surveying for the April 1 snow survey, the peak snow survey of the year. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So when do we get our water? Snowfall happens during the fall, winter, and spring, November through April and May. Sometimes it can be really cold. You can get some snowstorms in June, sometimes July, but the big amount comes in this November through April time period. And then the whole, this is, I like to call these spaghetti plots because it's like a whole bunch of squiggly lines. Um, don't worry too much about the detail. You see all these lines, it's different years. You have a lot of snowpack in the big green line. You have a little bit of snowpack in that little like pink line and the black line and the red line down at the bottom. The turquoise kind of shows the average where we're peaking right around April 1st. That's why we do the April 1 snow survey. This year, we're at about 40% of average. So 40% of that little turquoise. And you can, if you look really close, you could see the blue line and it says right there, 44%. That's where we're at right now. Um, and then when, when does it, so it comes November through April, it runs off March through July in general. You know, it can happen before, it can happen after. The rivers kind of flow all year round. That's called base flow. There's an amount of water that just comes off the watershed. It's like a slow leaking system. The water moves from the snowpack into the soil, into the rock, into the river, and it just takes a while to drain out. Um, and then if you, if you squint really hard, you can see one of my predecessors, old colleagues, just retired. He's actually measuring flow in the Kings River in um, Sequoia National Park. So this water is coming from the mountains in snowpack, gets into the rivers and starts flowing to where we're at. We go to the next slide. Oh, and this is a, a, a map um, of our area, the Kings River area, the blue, the Fresno is kind of that gr a gray spot in the middle of a blue area right where her pointer is. Um, that's kind of smack dab in the middle of Fresno Irrigation District. This is a map of different irrigation districts and where the Kings River water flows when it comes out of the mountains. And this purple kind of 
blob shape off to the right. It's like a, a circle. That's the Kings River Basin, the mountains. That's a, a million acres of mountains, about 1,500 square miles uh, that has our, our snow supply. Um, it melts off and goes into the Pine Flat uh, Reservoir. And then from there can be stored and released to irrigate all of this land, about a million acres of ag land um, and city water supply um, in Fresno County, Tulare County, and Kings County. Um, all three of those counties are in the top 10 agricultural producers in the nation. Fresno County is the top agriculture production county in the nation. We produce more dollars in agriculture commodities than any other county in the, in the nation. It's, um, go ahead and go to the next slide. And, but when do we need it? It's not when it rains. It's not when it snows. It's not even when it melts. So luckily we have a reservoir, a picture of Pine Flat Reservoir on the right-hand side nice and full with some water behind it. Um, that was built for flood control, but also for conservation storage to store the water till when we need it. Um, another graph with two lines, don't wanna confuse anybody, but you have dates on the bottom and amount of flow on the top. This is from last year. The blue line was how the water came off the mountain how it melted off and ran down the river. So as it melted, um, it went up. And then as the melt kind of subsided and it was draining out all that soil, it, it went down back to its base flow. Then it got stored. Some of it got stored in Pine Flat Reservoir um, and then was released later when it was needed for irrigation. And that's the pink line, when it was released. And you could see that there's a two and a half sometimes three month gap in between the time when it ran off to when we need it for irrigation for all the crops. Um, go on to the next slide. And because of that disparity, that, that lag time between when we, it runs off and when we need it, and we have to know how much room we need to store it in, we need to know how much is out in the snowpack. And that's the fun part. You get to go by helicopter, ski, snowshoes, snowmobile, out to some of the most remote, beautiful spots in the Sierra Nevada and measure snowpack. During the summer, you get to go out and uh, fix weather stations so that we can have uh, real-time data coming in in between these snow surveys. And you go out and you measure snowpack. Um, this is part of the California Cooperative Snow Survey Program um, that Department of Water Resources has. Um, many agencies, the Forest Service, Park Service, um, Ca uh, Kings River Water Association um, are part of the Cooperative Snow Survey. We share data. Um, in fact, I received an email just now from uh, one of our partners at uh, Pacific Gas and Electric with some detailed information that we're going to compile and use in the next slide, which is really cool. The snow survey has been happening for over 100 years. You go out with a metal tube, you weigh the snow, you figure out how much snowpack is on the course, and there's a statistical relationship between how much was there and how much runs off. The next big thing is modeling and remote sensing of snowpack. So right now we have a, a model that is running for the entire Kings River Basin that is using all types of weather information to tell us how much volume of, of water we have in the snowpack in real time. Every day we get a new report. Last weekend, we just had an airplane fly over the 1500 square miles with a fancy laser shooting down and measuring snow depth to within one centimeter accuracy. All that information is coming together to give us real numbers for volume of, of water stored in that snowpack. It's good. This is a new groundbreaking tool for water managers that we're hoping keeps gaining steam throughout the entire Sierra Nevada and can be used to really measure um, accurate 
uh, water volumes. So that's the, my quick Kings River primer um, on water and where we're at with snowpack. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Does anyone have any questions for him before we wrap up today? How Being long? a snow surveyor is fun. <laughs> yeah. How long have you been doing this for? Um, let's see, 15 years. Awesome. And it's a new question. thing every year. I have a question for Matt. Um, how can students get involved with helping doing surveys? Yeah, there are, it's harder now because of the COVID pandemic, mm -hmm. um, but there have been efforts in the past to have um, citizen science um, and engagement. Um, and in fact, uh, our partners that do the airborne surveys are very interested in having some type of community um, information because even though you're flying and getting very accurate information over in the entire basin, you still have to have that ground measurement to calibrate the sensors. So there are opportunities uh, for students, I believe. Um, they're kind of few and far between because of the remote nature of it. Um, it a 45 minute helicopter ride is not something that a high school student can uh, get up and go do. But uh, um, once you get into the college level, it becomes uh, part of like a hydrology program water uh, water resource management uh, type program um, on both from the snow survey side but also uh, river and canal water measurement side awesome thank you appreciate it does anyone else have any other questions okay if not then i just wanted to say thank you to everyone who joined us today and taking time out of your busy schedules to share a little bit about what it is that you do um, for a living, we know we're, we're all busy and this is an ideal time to just do something virtually and we'd love to do this in person and hopefully that will happen next year. So again, I just wanted to thank you and we really appreciate your support with CLBL and helping students be educated in different areas of agriculture that they don't always think about. So I appreciate your time and your generosity for spending with us. Oh, thank you for having us. It was it was a fun experience. And we'll be in touch about next year. Um, it's looking like things will be in person. So you'll be getting emails from me um, trying to set that stuff up for, for the following school year. So we're looking awesome. forward to that and planning. All right. So you guys are all free to go. Again, thank you. I really appreciate it. It's been great. And we will talk soon. Take care. See you guys. Thank you. Bye.